Hey, yo, microbiology, you got Sug McD talking about protus like fungi. And some reviews. So, first review, then the fungi. So, animal like, plant like, fungus like. Okay, got that. Animal like, protozoan, first animal, contains a nucleus, does not have a cell wall, does not have chlorophyll or chloroplast, so they are heterotrophs. They have to get their own food and eat it. They can move them, so let's check out the group. We've got four groups. We've got sarcodians, ciliates, flagellates, and sporozoans. These are not new. Sarcodians, the amoeba, pseudopod, false foot, extensions of the cell membrane and the cytoplasm, used for movement and capturing food. Do you remember what it's called when they surround it to capture food? Phagocytosis. Cool thing about these guys is many of them have shells. And when they are either die or release their shell, their shells collect on the bottom of the floor. When those get compacted, they actually create limestone, marble, and chalk. Believe it or not. So, next, we've got the amoebas. I'm still going on to the amoebas. They're the most familiar of the sarcodians, pseudopod, blob-like shapes. We've got two things you need to know. Contractile vacuoles, squeezing out the water, and food vacuoles, where they store their food. Okay, they have a split personality. Aha, they split by binary fission. Okay, amoebas do respond to their environment. They can move towards or away from things. Movement is known as taxis. So we've got two types of taxis that they can do. They can, are they are light sensitive, so that's going to be phototaxis, moving towards or away from the light. And they can respond to chemicals, that's known as chemotaxis. They can either move towards the chemical or away from the chemical. Again, taxis is movement. Phototaxis and chemotaxis. Okay, next, cilia. They have cilia. They're tiny hair-like, used for movement, gathering food. Or the feelers, just to check out what's around them. Okay, paramecium. We've got a tough outer wall. Flipper-like shape. Oral grooves. Skullet, which holds its food. Food vacuole for digestion. Anal pore, removes the waste. Two contractile vacuoles. Two nuclei. And they reproduce by conjugation. Okay, so remember, conjugation. Two of them line up beside each other. They touch and they share their DNA. Okay, next, flagellate or zooflagellate. Okay, have a flagellum with light structure. Many live inside animals in a symbiotic relationship. Most of them are mutualistic, which means both partners benefit. Four zones. These guys are not mutualistic. All of these are parasites. They feed on cell body and fluid. The spores, they form spores, which can then, are tiny reproductive cells, pass from one partner to the next, one host to another, and they pass from ticks, mosquitoes, and other animals to humans. Not cool. So, importance of animal life. They can be harmful. They can cause disease. Y'all have heard of malaria. Malaria is uh, caused by a plasmodium protist. And it spread through mosquitoes. So the mosquito introduces these dudes into our blood system and causes malaria. Same type of deal with African sleeping sickness over here. We have a trypanosome, which is another type of animal-like protist. And it's spread by the tsetse fly. The tsetse fly again comes down, pokes us, and introduces this harmful protist to us. Now, we do have some benefits as well. They recycle nutrients and break down organic matter. They're a good food source for other organisms. They are mutualistic, and they help others that they live with. An example of that is the trichonympha, okay? Now, it doesn't help us, but it helps termites. And you're like, eh, termites, shmermites. But they're the guys that actually allow termites to eat and break down wood. The termites do not have the enzymes to actually digest the wood and break it down, so the trichonympha provide the enzyme. Without the trichonympha, they would not be able to destroy our houses. So, plant-like protists, algae, unicellular, multicellular, or colony. Remember, if it's a colony, then it's going to be made up of the same type. Okay, they can move on their own. They're autotrophs. They make their own food by photosynthesis. 70% of the arc's oxygen is produced by these dudes. And they do have pigments, which provide them color and lots of different colors. 
So let's check it out. We've got the euglenoids, the diatoms, the gynoflagellates, the red algae, the green algae, and the subground algae. Again, we've gone over this, so I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Euglenoids, green, unicellular, fresh water, autotrophs, but they can be heterotrophs. When there's no sun outside, what do they do? They capture and eat their food. They have a flagella, an eye spot that is sensitive to light. So again, these guys can do phototaxis, moving towards or away from the light. They have a chloropath and a pellicle. Okay, that's going to be the outer membrane covering outside of their uh, cell membrane. So we got diatoms, which are going to be unicellular. Over 10,000 different species, aquatic, glass-like. They have geometric shapes, and they create diatomaceous earth. So when these guys die, they can actually fall down to the earth and create diatomaceous earth, powder. This powder can be used to scrape things, such as toothpaste to scrape off our plaque, car polish to scrape off any dirt or impurities. And they can be used in reflective paint because of their nice glass shape to them. So again, you see glass-like figures in geometric shape? Those are going to be diatoms. Dinoflagellates. Dino are under uh, unicellular. Their cell walls are like plated armor. They have two flagella. That's where the dye comes from. Dye, flagellates, two flagellates. They spin when they move. They're colorful. They can glow in the dark. And they cause red tide. Now, red tide occurs at the beach. And what happens is we have a huge algal bloom of these dinoflagellates. Now, what they can be harmful to the actual sea creatures there, but they can also irritate our skin and cause respiratory issues, so you don't want to swim when there's a red tide. Okay, red algae. It's red. Great. Multicellular seaweed. They live in the deep ocean water. Used for ice cream and hair conditioner. Hmm. Also used in Asian food. Green algae. It's green. Most are unicellular. Some form colonies like the Volvox here. Few are multicellular. Can live in fresh and salt water. And damp places on land. These guys just don't have to stick to the water. They just need damp places. Very closely related to the green plants. Okay, so we've got the brown algae. It's brown. It's commonly known as seaweed. It can contain brown, green, yellow, orange, or black pigments. Any of those colors, it can do it. So, they attach to rocks, and they have air bladders to help them keep afloat. So, they are also known as the giant kelp, which can be over 100 meters long. If you've ever watched any of the um, underwater adventures or different things, you might have seen these huge seaweed forests or kelp forest. They're just hanging down everywhere. That's going to be brown algae. Believe it or not, too, they're used as food thickeners. Yummy. So, uses of algae. Good food source. Produce oxygen. And they're used in sushi, ice cream, salad dressing, plastic, paint, and agar. Okay. Fungus-like protists. This is the new stuff. So we're talking about the protist-like fungi with Nick D. We've got heterochokes. We have cell walls. Remember, they're not like fungus cell walls. That's what makes them different. That's why they're not in the fungus and they're put in the protist, which is the catch-all that. They have a different type of cell wall. They do have, many have flagella, and are able to move at some point in their lives. We have the slime mold, the water mold, and the downy mold. Three types. They all reproduce by spores, which are tiny cells that are able to grow into full organisms. Now these spores are going to be released, and they can either fly, or move, or be brought to other places and create new organisms. So, the water and downy mold must live in water or moist places. Tiny thread like that look like fuzz. You might see them on leaves a lot of the time. They attack food crops, and the water mold were specifically the ones that caused the Irish potato famine. Over in Ireland, way back when, there was this, they were all relied upon eating potatoes. That was their thing. They ate potatoes. What a potato? You got a potato. It was eating potatoes. Everything was about potatoes. Well, this water mold came through and devastated the potato crop. No potatoes. 
hundreds of thousands to millions died due to not being able to eat potatoes. They didn't have anything else. So we call it the mass exodus also from Ireland. And people left to try to find food in other countries, in other places. So, we got our slime molds going on. These guys are really neat because they have what are known as fruiting bodies. And these fruiting bodies contain the spores. And they can bust and either the wind will take them or water will take them. Or somebody or something will take the spores to a new place. And they will attach and then reform. So, they first look like amoebas, but then they look like molds. So, we've got many different stages of their life. They live on moist and shady places, and they feed on bacteria and other microorganisms. Importance of fungus like protists, recycle dead and organic material, enriching the topsoil, providing nutrients. The circle of life. Yeah, but that's about it. Otherwise, they're harmful. They cause the blight, they cause ick on your fish, if your goldfish ever starts becoming fuzzy, yeah, that'd be the water mold. So, let's not actually get those. Okay, cool. So, have fun. Here's a paramecium prank for you. What did they shave off? Okay, thank you to all my help, and I will see you.